This week, robo surgeons, swinging superstars, and Sean Bean toilet duck. Here on Click, we're constantly coming across jaw-dropping medical marvels, from robo-nurses to AI, which can out-diagnose experts. We've seen the future of medicine evolving before our eyes. It's fair to say medicine has come a long way. This is the old operating theatre museum in London. Of course there's an old operating theatre museum. Why wouldn't there be? Back in the late 1800s, for example, this was the cutting edge, literally. And in the 130 years since, surgery has changed beyond recognition. But as with all technology, we mustn't become over-reliant on it. We mustn't think that it will do everything and we mustn't think that it will work every time. Last week, we were given a sombre reminder of this when an inquest found that a cardiac patient, Stephen Petit, had died as a result of undergoing pioneering heart surgery using a da Vinci robot. Had his surgery been of the traditional kind, he would almost certainly have survived. I think if a surgeon is going to use a robot, and use is the right techni technical term, he has to be very well practised with it. I think that was an example where the team were not sufficiently trained or prepared to do that operation. Uh, and therefore it was a very, very, very long operation uh, that ultimately uh, went badly. We reached out to Intuitive Surgical, the company behind the Da Vinci robot used in Stephen Petit's operation. They provided a statement expressing their condolences to Mr. Petit's family and reiterating that patient safety is their priority. But they said they don't provide and can't enforce a mandatory medical training regime before a surgeon uses their robotic system. This training and validation remains with hospitals. They say that more than 5 million Da Vinci robot assisted procedures have been performed by more than 40,000 trained surgeons worldwide. So where now for robotic surgery? Well, Paul Carter has been to see one robot manufacturer's centre of operations, as well as getting an inside look at some real-life surgery. At London's Royal Marsden Hospital, we've been allowed access to see these surgical robots in action. And following the death of Stephen Pettit, it was interesting to find out more about how surgeons train in VR and how they overcome losing the sense of touch they'd have if they were using their hands. Before anyone goes anywhere near a patient, they're expected to do a good deal of training on that system uh, in, in virtual reality uh, beforehand. Yes, you lose the tactile uh, feedback, but you've got very uh, clear imaging um, and you can very, very clearly and precisely define your dissection. Well, I think that, that is important. That, um, we call that haptic feedback, uh, tactile feedback, and it's something that's very important in certain circumstances. And it was something I was worried about as I started my training in robotics. But actually you develop a kind of visual feedback. You can tell how much tension you're putting under the, uh, the tissues under um, just by looking at them. In this procedure, Robotic technology will be used to remove a cancerous tumour in the patient's stomach, with fluorescent dye used to light up the area. During the procedure, Surgeon Miles Smith, assisted by Asif Chowdhury, controls three robotic arms which he manipulates to remove the tumour. The aim is to greatly reduce surgical trauma, as the robot method is far less invasive than more traditional laparoscopic surgeries. The Da Vinci robot makes it possible for surgeons to operate deep inside the body through microscopic incisions. I'm going to have to keep my voice down a little bit because this is quite a critical part of the operation. Um, what's actually happening behind me is they're fitting the ports into the patient's stomach, which is where the robot will actually dock onto um, to perform the actual operation um, a little bit later on. 
The robotic console actually uses keyhole surgery, whereby instruments enter the patient's body through small holes instead of large cuts. That means less blood loss, less trauma, and also quicker recoveries. The robot has four arms, three of which carry tiny surgical instruments and one of which sports a camera. Ports need to be put in place before the robot can be wheeled in to dock its arms. After the robot arms have successfully been attached, the surgeons relocate to consoles in a different part of the room. What's remarkable about this system is that it's genuinely remote. You can see the arms moving behind me and they almost look like they're moving independently. They're actually being controlled by Miles, who's sat at a console several feet away from the patient. The remote consoles provide the surgeons with 3D visualisations and magnified images allowing complex dissection or reconstruction. So through these eyepieces here, I can actually see a 3D representation of the inside of the patient's abdomen, you, uh, which is slightly not what I was expecting to look at this morning, but it, oh, yeah, no compared to what we were seeing before on the screens, it's much more, it's much more vivid and you can get a real sense of depth in terms of what they're actually operating on. The surgeon controls the arms from the console through finger loops that mimic their hands' natural movements. The hand gestures are translated into smaller, more precise motions while filtering out tremors. They, they move naturally, and then what you can do is to move forward. You, it's like, re, like pulling a newspaper towards yourself. The cameras can also switch from black and white to colour, meaning that fluorescent dye can be used inside the body to isolate tumours. So the tumour's just been cut off, for what a better phrase. And it's just extraordinary, they put in a little, uh, a little tool and bagged it up. Yeah, okay, great. Yep, that's it, let's take out the ports. Intuitive Surgery, who make the Da Vinci system used at the Royal Marsden, have almost complete market dominance, but now new robotic surgery players are starting to emerge. We've come to California to visit Auris Health, who are developing robotics for a different type of surgical procedure. Auris's Monarch platform concentrates on endoscopy, a procedure which lets surgeons deliver treatment to a patient's organs through their natural bodily openings, such as the mouth, meaning no incisions are required. It can manoeuvre through a patient's airways, even into the far and narrow parts of the lungs, and when combined with CT scans, it can provide a GPS map of the patient's internal organs, allowing surgeons to navigate precisely to areas of interest or concern. So it's not just a case of uh, a surgeon almost sort of blindly navigating their way through until they find it. This is actually following a, a map. Exactly right. Exactly right. And the analogy I like to use is, this is my windshield. I keep my focus on the patient's anatomy. This is my map, and it'll inform me as I go. What's remarkable about this system is that it's taking something that's actually quite complex. I mean, this is the representation of the insides of a person, and it's taking it down to something actually quite intuitive and, and quite simple. I mean, I'm using what is essentially a modified games controller to operate this scope here, and I'm no surgeon and I've been using this for a couple of minutes and I'm able to make quite precise movements. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. It's clear that robotics finding different surgical niches is one area of growth, but what else does the future hold for surgical robotics? There's no reason why in the future we shouldn't be able to uh, train robots to differentiate between structures that we want to preserve and structures that we want to remove. Uh, perhaps a bit like uh, driverless cars, um, but, but in this case a, uh, a surgeonless robot, possibly initially under the control of, 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 of a surgeon. Perhaps certain parts of the procedure might be automated, as you might set, th set things up in a certain way and press, almost press play so that it will, it will complete a set program. But I, I don't see them taking over from us, but I see them certainly assisting us. Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was the week that Amazon announced the location of its second headquarters. Well, second and third, it will be split between New York City and Arlington, Virginia. 
And the New York Times has accused Facebook of hiring a PR firm to discredit its critics and competitors. Facebook has responded by saying that there are a number of inaccuracies in the report and that they have since cut ties with the company involved. Brace yourselves, people, because we can see this one going on for a while. And China's Sunway Taihu Light supercomputer has been pushed off top place in the list of the world's most powerful machines. The new number one, Summit by IBM. Scientists in Bristol have developed a game lab to better entertain our second closest relatives, gorillas. Cameras, sensors and microchips are hidden in an interactive unit, which is providing researchers greater insight into their enjoyment and could help them better understand how primates solve complex problems. And just when you thought the world couldn't get any more bizarre, check this out. It's the happiest day of 35-year-old Akihiko Kondo's life as he lifts up the veil of his bride to kiss her. The only snag is that she's a virtual reality pop star. Hatsune was represented by a stuffed doll during the $18,000 Tokyo wedding. Back home, a holographic version of Mrs. Kondo literally lights up when her husband gets in from work. Yeah, it's a weird, weird world. Now, we dedicated much of last week's programme to issues surrounding fake news. We took you to Kosovo to look at the fake news factories based there and found that Facebook did seem to be having some success in taming the problem. Well, this week we're off to India, arguably the new epicentre of fake news. Now there it travels largely on another platform, WhatsApp which means it is a lot harder to police and it's having some really severe consequences. David Reid has been investigating. I'm on the prowl for cheap mobile data. So tell me, what's the deal? You reach out for 149 for one month. How much data do I get? 1.4 gigabytes per day for 28 days. 1.4 gigabytes a day, 149 rupees a month. Come on, that's just... Five rupees per day. Five rupees per day. Five rupees per day. 42 gig of mobile data cost $2 in India. In the UK, £40 or $50. In the US, $100. Yeah, this is a very expensive for other countries. Obviously, people here earn far less than they do in the US or UK. Still, mobile internet is so cheap here that it's knocking up around 500 million users. And that's throwing up issues, the most serious of which is fake news. Balkrishan Birla runs a site that's debunking the rising tide of fakery, evidenced earlier this year when every story on YouTube's India trending feed turned out false. Scroll through Birla's site and much there's clearly fake, but for many who are new to modern media, it's believable, even important. Nowadays, if you look at a lot of content is getting created in all Indian languages, and that reaches out to the entire spectrum of people in India, not just the educated class. And it's in sheltered rural communities where sham stories do most damage. Many have been killed this year in mob violence, triggered by false rumours of child abductions. So how do you deal with this? Well, you have to act quickly because, according to recent research, Bad news travels fast, fake news travels faster still, and further. And we can all spread it when we rub up against one another in public, online spaces. Each of us can carry or catch the contagion. Researchers at Delhi's Indian Institute of Technology are using the same maths for modelling epidemic disease to understand how false rumours spread. The main driver is trust. I believe what you say because I know you or I know that you think like the way I do. The same trust we want to use in the opposite direction. If you trust me and you, sp you tell me something I know to be fake, if I tell you that is fake, stop spreading it, there is some chance that you may stop spreading it. We are talking about an inoculation of, of sorts which takes place using the trust that is already present in the network. You could just see how a trusted community leader in the loop could help quell panic from a mischievous rumour. But you can't help wondering whether the tech companies could do more. So let me ask this to Google actually back. In your tools, do you support other languages? The answer is yes, right? They have a local team who sells ads out here, right? So it's not that, that sales happens out of a UK or a US place, right? 
So we can really you can put a sales team out here. Why can't you put a fake news detection team as well? Google likes to waive algorithms and issues. It's now highlighting authoritative sources for some countries. It also trains local journalists to fight fakery. We'll have to see if its hands-off approach stems the fake news epidemic. That was David in India. Next, we're going to talk golf, a stubbornly traditional sport, but one which is ready to embrace the newest technology, as Lara Lewington has been finding out. This is Wentworth Club, which in just a few years is going to be celebrating its centenary. But over that hundred years, a lot has changed. And in recent times, much of that has come down to technology. So we're going to go and see how both amateurs and professionals have been making good use of that. Lasers, radars, sensors and motion capture have transformed data collection. And analysing these statistics means training and play can be more precise than ever before. And who better to show us than one of the greatest golfers on the planet, Francesco Molinari, fresh from wins this year at both the Ryder Cup and the Open Championship. One of the difficulties with golf that there's so many elements and so many even just parts of the body moving during the swing that uh, any little difference any little difference makes a makes a change those tiny differences are captured by the kind of tech usually reserved for big budget hollywood films 27 reflective markers over his body help to create a digital double that allows francesco's famous swing to be analyzed in exhaustive detail this avatar will, will, will pick up endless, endless um, parameters in terms of um, where, he's, you know, where his alignment is, where his shoulders are, how his body's moving, his, his, his flexibility, his weight movement. This system has picked up hundreds of thousands of, of, of swings and golf shots, which, is, which, which has become our database. Optical motion capture analysis uses high-speed cameras to track every movement in the golfer's body and club. This provides Francesco's team with data that would have been impossible to measure just a few years ago. So this, this is Trapman. The radar basically picks up all the data surrounding the golf ball, surrounding the golf club. It picks out points of, of that and then gives us the data that we can see. So we've got ball speed. We've got launch angles. We know how, how high the ball launched out of the golf club. Fifteen years ago, you would have been in the field watching the ball, whereas now we can actually physically see. Slightly intimidating being this close, but I guess he does know how to hit the ball the right way. The technology tracks the distance, power and trajectory of the ball using a combination of HD cameras and a Doppler radar. It also measures microwave transmissions that reflect back from a moving golf club and ball. 551.49 You hear it where you say players have a good feel. We're putting numbers on the field, so in a way we're calibrating feel. But without the technology, we'd have no benchmark. It really would be, you know, one of those. But this gives us hard data. It's a crucial measuring tool. Otherwise, if you think about it, old school, we'd hit all five balls and then go and look at them and measure them and write them all out. That's the only way you can learn is to have immediate feedback. And, and this is sensational for that. But is this in some ways ruining the game? Before there was a lot of guessing going on and it was just going really on the, on the feel of, of the players and our feel. Uh, now there's, there's just a lot more feedback, it's objective, it's numbers. There's people uh, with lasers zapping our, our ball after every shot so we know exactly how far we hit every shot, how far offline, uh, how far from the flag. So far it's been almost impossible to track every, every single thing and now with the, with the technology that you've seen today, we're getting closer and closer to having an exact idea of what's going on. Definitely technology has been a massive help for tracking every ball and, and getting immediate feedback. So I wouldn't be as good a player for sure without the help of the technology.
And that may well be true, but ultimately the player has to be skilled enough to act on the data that's being recorded. And of course, this isn't going to turn just anyone into a star player. That was Lara with one of the biggest sporting stars of the moment. And we're going to continue that theme now, kind of, because Mark Chislak has hooked up with one of the biggest movie stars of the moment, Sean Bean, who's appearing in a video game near you soon. Star of stage plus the big and small screen, Sean Bean has kicked the bucket in a lot of the roles he's played, so much so that it's a thing on the internet. And now gamers are going to get the chance to digitally do in the legendary actor when he appears as a special guest star target in the video game Hitman 2. Good morning, 47. Your target is Mark Faber, also known as the Undying. The Hitman games cast the player as Agent 47, employed by a shadowy organisation to dispatch a series of individuals across the globe, employing a wide variety of weapons from explosives to seafood, as well as donning deadly disguises to take out their target. It's using your head. While the main game hangs off a single-player story mode, it also features a variety of online modes, including targets which only appear for a short period of time and which the player will only have one attempt to kill, so-called elusive targets. Sean Bean is one of these. He plays ex-MI5 agent Mark Farber, nicknamed The Undying, for his ability to fake his own death. <laughs> well, it's not really death I've cheated. Just humans. Sean, can you tell us about Mark Farber, the character that you play in Hitman 2? He's perfect at what he does. He's very particular, he's very precise, skillful, intelligent. He's got imagination above all. He's got a price on his head and he's forever devising new uh, methods, uh, very um, uh, extravagant methods of assassination. So he's, uh, he's quite arrogant, he's quite lonely, but he's, uh, he's got a certain amount of charm, I feel. Is there any difference for you in playing a character in a video game as opposed to playing a character in a movie or TV show? Yeah, it was, uh, it was good. It was something I've never done before. Yeah, I guess playing a character in a video game, I, I, I mean, I, I only filmed for one day, so, I mean, we had a quite a small kind of area of being able to develop um, uh, something, some kind of personality, but I think we did, and, I, I, you know, I did a lot of voiceover for it previously, and uh, you get some idea of who he is, and I think we captured that within a day, and then it's out of my hands then. But it's different in that you don't have to film for, you know, weeks or months, you know, and. Uh, I, and you can just, uh, I did the initial filming and then the motion capture, they decided they didn't need me after all and they've done it and I think, oh great, <laughs> that's it, yeah, okay. <laughs> now you've played lots of characters which have met a sticky end and not got to the end of, end of the movie or got to the end of the TV series. Is it going to be weird being in a game where thousands of players across the world are going to be the ones that are dispatching you? I guess so, you know, I mean, it's a, I, I guess it should be strange for me, but I, 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 for some reason it's not. I mean, I think they'll have a lot of fun and I am a bit cocky and arrogant in it, so, you know, it, 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 you know I'm kind of asking for it, really. <laughs> if you play this level, yeah. killing yourself. If I did, yeah, yeah. A vir or killing a virtual version of yourself. Yeah. If you were going to do that, what method would you choose then, out of all the methods that you've got that you could that you can kill this character with? Um, probably something drawn out and bloody and comical. Because a true assassin knows the world is always your best weapon. Cheers. Cheers, like and Bean. What a double act. And that's it for this week. But don't forget, we can be found all across social media, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. All you need to say is BBC Click and we'll be there. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.